Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Steve. So my name is Steve Bannister. Um, I bring greetings from the University of Utah, which of course hosted the uh, experiments of Fleischmann and Fox 30 years ago. There's still some activity going on at Utah, so I'm quite as excited as that. All hope is not lost. And I am an economist, so I, I suppose some of you have a question of what is my interest in uh, this kind of conference and your work. And let me, I'll, I'll show you why, you know, through my slides, but briefly, it's because um, while well, I developed an interest in the intersection of energy and economic growth prior to my knowledge of this field of coal fusion. Um, and then in 2011, with you know, the events that got, uh, became public, I got very interested in, in coal fusion, or LENR, or as, as a potential solution to the problems that my research exposes. So because of that, I've got a great interest in your, uh, in your research and your progress. Now, I, I titled this Limits to Growth um, because of work that was done by the public realm back in the 1970s when they produced a report called the Limits to Growth. It was actually pretty, pretty accurate, not, not completely accurate by any means. Um, but we've learned more since then. And in fact, the field, this, this field we call E3 now, which is the intersection of energy, economics, and the environment, is becoming a fairly robust and um, you know, formal field of study about these big global systems that we're involved in that, that sort of control our lives. So that's what, uh, that's what I, I study. That's what I'm going to show you today. Um, my earlier research led to th this graph, uh, a couple of graphs, this is one of them, that just shows the importance, the fundamental importance of energy as an input essentially to everything, <coughs> to all economic systems, to all activities and so forth. This, this is a, a graph of energy consumption which is in the uh, blue dots and gross domestic product or output of an economy in the red dots. And this is a representation of England going back to 1300 uh, up through sort of uh, the end of the 19th century. And what it shows is there's a, a, a very high correlation between energy inputs and, and economic output. So energy is fundamental to everything in the economy. And that's really why this new field of E3 is, is uh, coming about partially. There aren't a lot of economists that study this. I'm, I'm part of a, a small group, but I think it will grow. So energy is fundamental. And I'd like to just think for a moment about the importance of your research in, in condensed matter nuclear science. First of all, I think you are expanding, perhaps even exploding in some cases, the frontiers of physics. I mean, this is certainly certainly new physics that is, is um, necessary to explain the kind of reactions and events that you get. And uh, I, my observation from the outside is that that is really necessary to expand what physics can explain, current mainstream physics can explain. So I, I applaud and appreciate your efforts. Secondly, if you believe in the um, the anthropogenic global warming science, of global warming because of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. As I believe, uh, and as I acknowledge not everyone does, but I do, then certainly CMNS is a potent way to, to banish carbon sources. And I, I'm going to show you the graphs or my model here shortly. And I think we have to get to zero carbon. I mean, as quickly as possible, we have to get to zero carbon sources of energy. So certainly, LENR plays a uh, will play a role in that. I further observe that, the, and this is the economist in me, the cheaper the new sources of energy, the quicker carbon eradication will take place. So that's that's just very basic economics. These are price differentials that all economists understand. 
the wider the price differential, the quicker the old sources will be substituted away from or displaced. My first slide, the, the graph, showed that modern economic growth did start in England. And it started with what we call the Industrial Revolution. In some sense, that graph was a, a graph of the Industrial Revolution. My view, my research is oriented toward uh, examining that as a major energy revolution, which initially was initiated by substituting coal for wood. That was the critical first step in the Industrial Revolution, which was driven by price differentials. Because of deforestation, the price of wood was going up in England, and because they discovered readily accessible and transportable coal in the northeast of Newcastle, the price of coal was going down. And so, so it, it substituted, it took a, you know, a couple centuries for that to happen. Uh, it was a big technological challenge, but it did happen and that led to the eventually to steam power and the, and the Industrial Revolution and the world we live in today. Um, I believe if we can deploy a new, scalable, cheap, and clean energy source, such as perhaps produced by LENR, then we can have at least, at least another Industrial Revolution. And by that I mean the first Industrial Revolution we did it without, uh, it was sort of endogenous. It happened simply because of the forces that a whole bunch of people brought to bear. We know a lot about that from an economic development standpoint right now. And I believe that if we get a cheap enough source of energy, we can have an Industrial Revolution times two or three or four or even higher. And the implications of that are, are they're breathtaking to me as an economist, as a social scientist. The question is how cheap, well, as cheap as possible. I think, uh, you know, Jed Rothwell has a paper that indicates LENR can produce uh, energy, and correct me if I get this wrong, Jed, but 600 times cheaper than existing sources, including the cheaper renewables we have today. Well, that's pretty good. 600 is a nice price difference. That would go a long way if we can get to that. And really, then, the question is how much higher would you like your living standards to be? Because the correlation is the lower the price of energy, the higher the living standards. That's what, that's what that first graph showed. And that graph would go on, essentially, uh, as, as far up as we can supply energy. And I'm assuming that CMNS technology will work better than Microsoft technology. <laughs> So my last point was the cheaper the energy, the higher the living standards. And that's what that first graph showed. This graph is, uh, so the first one was in levels, you know, levels of uh, 
energy input levels of GDP output. This is per capita, or per person, which is the true measure that macroeconomists use as living standards, measure of living standards. And the, uh, this is a scatter plot now with per capita energy consumption on the x-axis and per capita uh, GDP on the, on the y-axis. And you can see it's very noisy, and it goes back, the data go back to 1300, so the data, you know, that's a long time ago. There's some, uh, well, at any rate, it's noisy data, but it does show certain aspects of history. I'm not going to point them all out in the interest of time here, but that first little dip is, can anyone guess what that is? Like that, right? We lost 30% of European population and, and GDP output and so forth, and per capita. But at any rate, the correlation overall is pretty good. It's about uh, 0.84 R squared, just on a linear, simple linear uh, interpolation. So that's pretty high. Um, what constrains economic growth? Well, I, I need to be very clear here as an economist. Uh, we're talking about the supply side, the production side of an economy in terms of macroeconomic growth and development terms. And uh, economists also have to consider the demand side of the economy, which in modern economies is the growth constraint currently. It's not the output side. We can produce just about as much as we wish today, given demand constraints. However, one lesson of the Industrial Revolution is that a sufficiently large positive supply shock, meaning reduction in energy costs, which was the Industrial Revolution, will tend to propel incomes and output into a higher gear. People will have higher incomes through normal processes and will be able to purchase more and the whole economy will keep on growing. This effect is driven by a large, even a very large, hopefully, price differential between old energy sources and the new one. And I go to my model now, in the interest of time. So, so my modeling, which again preceded my, my awareness of LNR, is called the Kaya Identity Model, which dates to the 1990s, and a Japanese researcher by the name of Kaya. And it's variously classified as a um, intensity model. Um, in, actually, in economics, we call it a growth accounting model. And there is the simple, it's a very simple model. It's very different than the ones used in the IPCC, the UN climate work today, which is extremely complicated and difficult to understand. But this is a very simple model that tries to do the same thing. And going from uh, left to right, on the left-hand side, that's the carbon dioxide flux of the entire global system. And then on the right-hand side, we have four terms. The capital P is the population level. So I believe any long-term macroeconomic model has to consider what's happening in population levels, or it's going to be nonsense. And then the three smaller uh, lower case are what we call intensities, which are defined, I've defined in a table, and that's how we calculate them. But essentially G is the per capita living standards, which Kai calls the GDP intensity. E is the energy intensity, or the energy input per unit of GDP output. And F is the um, CO2 intensity of each unit of energy. And that's how we calculate them from these inputs. So it's relatively simple, right? You just accumulate this data, uh, calculate the ratios. And this, is, this has been done, this kind of work has been done for quite a while. Um, my innovation was I did the work well, let me, let me describe these intensities first. I think those are large enough, even though you won't be able to read the type. This is the, the oops. This is the GDP intensity or living standards. This data goes back to um, uh, 1960, and it's, it's based on, this is a global model. So this is every, all the output in the world divided by total world population, okay? There's a massive amount of momentum in this data. And that, the only, the only time that that line, live, global living standards, gets interrupted is when we have a recession, a global recession. The rest of the time, it is on a, you know, sort of a straight, almost linear path upward. And I think that will continue. I think that's, 
built into the system, built into us as people and into the system. The second graph is the um, energy uh, intensity of GDP. And here we were, at, so going down means we get more efficient. So we were doing very nicely up until about 2000. And then we started going sideways. And the reason we went sideways is someone surely can guess this. China, most of China. I won't, I'm not going to place all the blame on them. Um, and then the, the really worrying graph is the third one, which is the carbon intensity of energy. Um, carbon for unit of energy. And I point out this is from all sources, all sort, all primary sources. Meaning everything, all the data about renewables is included in these. Right? So it's in there. <laughs> and look what happened again starting about 2000. We, we retraced our progress by a third. And again, this was I, I, I hate to blame the Chinese. I mean, they had good outcomes economically, but they did this by building coal-fired electricity plants. And that's what happened. And it wasn't only China, but a, a good chunk was. So that's the one we have to banish, right? We need to get rid of carbon sources, um, as we'll see. Okay, so those are actuals. People have done this before, so there's not much new here. What is fairly innovative, uh, and originally when I did this, uh, other people have started doing it, is forecasting that. So taking each of these parameters, these great fundamental structural parameters of uh, per capita GDP, energy intensity, and, and carbon intensity, and forecasting them using whatever the best fit forecasting method was. I'm not going to talk about that here. I'm happy to do it at my poster session. And we can see the, fo the forecast on, whoops, on um, per capita GDP goes pretty much straight up. The energy intensity does uh, slow down a bit because of the sideways move recently because of China, but it still tends down. But uh, because of this terrible energy or uh, carbon intensity performance in the last 20 years, this forecast is headed up, although this is the uncertainty band, and I, so I'm not very certain about that. I hope it tends down again. I hope it does. But this is the best forecasting method I am aware of in order to get to the data that we have. And I, again, I, 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 the, the amount of data in these slides encompasses the entire global system. There's a tremendous amount of momentum in these data. The implications and I, are these. These are level curves with the forecast. Now what I don't show you here is the population forecast. And I simply use one of the UN population forecasts. There's a lot of uh, debate going on about population forecasts. You know, whether we're going to peak out in 2040 or, or after 2100. And I take the one of the UN, one of the more optimistic UN population forecasts that peaks out, I think, in 2065 or 2060. But at any rate, if you then take those forecasted intensities and multiply through by population, then you get these level curves. And this is, um, this is the total GDP forecast for the entire world going out to 2100. So that says, World GDP peaks somewhere around 2085 or 2090, and then we'll step, start heading down after that total. Per capita will still go up, but because population is going down, the total output will go down. And that's, a very, that's a very good news for environmentalists and people concerned about the environment. The second one is the um, energy, and it peaks much earlier, peaks about 20 in the 2060s. And this is the carbon, the total carbon output flux that peaks again in 2060. However, that's not really good news. I, I, I sort of characterize this whole analysis by saying, if any of you are familiar with the works of John Maynard Keynes, right? one of his fa famous sayings is, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> and what this curve shows is in the long run, we're going to start to become better from an environmental sustainability standpoint. But in the short run, 
we're going to fry. <laughs> I mean, the, if you integrate that curve, it implies a high three or low four degrees centigrade increase in global temperatures, which is, you know, can't be, it's going to be disastrous for a large portion of the population on current models. So those are the levels. Um, I call it sort of the inverse Keynes. Yeah. So in the you know in the long run we're going to be fine, short run we're going to be dead, or something like that. Okay, so in conclusion, I think a new clean energy source will be historic for for two monumental reasons. One is to eradicate carbon sources. And, I repeat, the cheaper the energy, the quicker we can eradicate carbon. An extra credit point here is that this new source is fully distributed, both for economic efficiency and for what I call equity or social equity, a fair sharing of energy resources across the population of the world. There are about a billion people alive right now that do not have electricity. And we need to fix that, and that needs to be fixed. But the second big point, point separately, but very important, is to launch this new industrial revolution that I talked about a, a bit earlier. And um, some of you will know of the, of the Russian scientist Partyshev, an astrophysicist who recently died. But he developed a Partyshev scale of civilizations based on how much of the potential energy they captured, and they had it you know, a planetary basis, a solar system basis, and then a galaxy basis, and we're barely touching the planetary basis right now. So I'd like to say, rest in peace, Kardashev, he certainly has been inspirational in my, my thinking. Um, and I think the Leonard community is uh, a further step uh, along this Kardashev scale, um, because we'll be able to have a survivable, source of energy for the next industrial revolution. I don't think, by the way, that your work is the end of the road. I think there are other physics out there that we can, we can think about. Um, I don't want to you know, introduce that here, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. And I thank you very much for your time. Questions? Jack? I couldn't read the yes. timeline on yes. one of your view graphs, yes. but with your sophisticated projection method, where does it get to two parts per million? Oh, I haven't done that calculation. You're talking about the, the carbon curve? Yeah, because in the media we hear yeah. a lot of projections I, over decades. I mean, so I'm just wondering what's the most realistic trend. I, I just, I did, I took this curve, which includes both actual and the forecast, and integrate it to get the amount of carbon. Well, actually, I integrated on the forecast part. And, that, uh, and that's what I said, if you add that to the existing stock of carbon in the environment, according to the climate science models, we'll get us to high three or low, low four. I didn't do the 2%. I expect we're somewhere in here for the 2%. What right? year is that? That would be... Uh, 20, oh, 2025, 2030. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Thanks for an excellent talk. Really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, there's um, uh, some research I made somewhere, and I don't know whether your models factor it in because it, it looks at the people as just a unit number. But I think if you, I'm right in saying that if you get over the age of 42 as an average age of the population, they tend to use a lot less energy because they bought all the crockery and all of the furniture they need in their homes and they've done it for the children and stuff. So um, th does it uh, take that into consideration? And also with modern technology where phones are using, replacing vast numbers of individual items that used to be produced in the historical data and people are spending time just sitting at the computer playing games, uh, you've got the older generation and the younger generation maybe using a lot less energy. Um, how do you factor those into your data? Yeah, and, and the answer is I don't do it directly. Okay, I don't I don't create a scenario where that is. But but I'm going to repeat that this has everything we know about energy consumption in it today, including the aging of the population up until now, right? 
And if this projects it going forward now, will it be lower in the future? Actually, I don't know the answer to that. Because that's, that's, we're making a guess that, that older people in the future will consume less as current generation does. I can look at myself in the mirror and I'm not consuming less. You know, and I think I think I'm I'm not I'm maybe on the leading edge of, of what future older populations are going to be. So I don't I don't enter into this um, scenario game. I'm just presenting the best projection given all the possible data, and and no one can speculate. But you know I, I don't do that. Yet. The second part of your question was. Uh, I'm not sure what was. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, just about factors that are very different that, that are happening right now compared to like 20 years ago. Yeah, well, so in the mix of output, you know, we're using computers and phones more than whatever. Uh, again, it's all in there. It's all in that data. And therefore, the choice I've made is I'm going to use the existing mass of data to try to forecast the future. It's going to be wrong. All models are wrong. You know, that's, that's true. But we try to make useful models, and that's what I try to do. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for this uh, historical insight. You know. Yes. Because in the, imagine there is a new energy, cheap, uh, very cheap energy, giving this shock for a new industrial revolution. You will, you will need the industry to take this opportunity to develop something new. And how will we have to be present? Energy industry, you know, do you think the oil industry, just to name one, will accept that and will uh, and will support this, you know? How did this happen in the past? The answer is I don't think the oil industry is going to accept this. I think they'll fight very hard as they are now. And uh, and the coal industry is fighting hard in some parts of the world, including my country. Uh, if you get the price differential sufficient it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, I look, I've got a graph of wood prices in the 15th century in England, and they were going like that. And that's when coal started taking over, even with all of the costs involved in transitioning the technology to coal burning from wood burning. One, one of the great economic historians um, talks about having to invent a coal-burning house for London instead of wood fireplaces. They had a, it took them over a century to develop the right technology to replace wood fires with coal fires. But the cost differentials were so great that it's just going to happen if we get there. Hi, I'm another social scientist. <laughs> uh, well, of course, uh, one. The main effect on, from productivity to economic growth with but another interesting effect should LENR technologies be commercialized will be on welfare particularly. Not only in developing economies, but also in developed economies. Yeah. Because if you think what share of GDP we use for so-called defense defensive expenditures, meaning just to offset damage done by burning fossil fuels, which, by the way, is, is counted positively for, for GDP. Okay. So that counts as GDP growth yeah. if you want to offset damage. But so it, once you don't have that kind of defense expenditures anymore, you could use the same money for investment that would actually bring welfare, like, I mean, better infrastructure or yeah. uh, school. Uh, of course, you're right. And uh, the other aspect, so that's right, the other aspect that I don't cover in this model is the issue of the distribution of output and the growing trend toward income and wealth inequalities in most of the major economies. That's just simply left out of that. But my notion of a distributed energy source, cheap energy source, will begin to mitigate that because Everyone will have sort of equal access to very cheap energy that they don't have right now, including the million people that don't even have electricity today. So, so there are important aspects that are left out of the model. There's no question about that. Um, how do you factor in the uh, the of the environment into your models here um, because we're seeing interruptions in the economy due to factors of storms and all kinds of uh, natural disasters. 
Right. Um, thank you, Ruby. Um, well, the answer is I don't, again, I don't do any guessing or scenarios about that. Whatever's in the data is what shows up. And an example of that is in, oops, you know, these interruptions in the per capita growth, which were also accompanied by interruptions in total growth. And those are recessions, but those are economic recessions. I mean, you see that the climate disasters are somewhere in the slope. You don't see big continuities because of climate change yet. Now, you may in the future. I don't know. I just don't know. I expect the slope of that line may go down a little bit if we don't fix the problem. But big interruptions, again, are because of macro, global macroeconomic events that lead to global recessions. And that's, that's the biggest interruption in growth that I see. Yeah. OK, OK, thank you, everyone, uh, for a very good session. And for very good session. We will resume back in this room after lunch at 2.